Good afternoon, everybody. Okay, and happy birthday, UMBC. See, come on, you can do this a little louder. <laughs> now that's, that's the group. I'm Carl Steiner, I'm the Vice President for Research here at UMBC, and really glad to see you all coming in and already in the seats for uh, part of the big celebration this weekend. Uh, we're here in the Earl and uh, Danielle Linehan Concert Hall, and if I were Freeman, I would ask everybody to give a great hand to the Linehans for helping us build this beautiful <laughs> facility. And I want to welcome you to this very first uh, session in our inaugural GridX Forum. And I'm sure you all knew that last month and last year already what GRIT really stands for. Global Research Innovation Trends, and then we added excellence to it. I think that's really part of what UMBC is all about. We started the planning for, for this event nine, ten months ago when we got ready for uh, the, the uh, 50th anniversary. And the idea was really a, a way of sharing much of the research, the scholarship, and the creative achievement that's going on at this campus. Not just by our faculty, but also by our many alumni. How many of you are alumni in the room? Awesome, welcome back. You already know that the program is organized into three sessions, 30 minutes each with ten, uh, uh, three speakers at 10 minutes each, and we'll hold them to that. Uh, but we really wanted to put a program together that gives you during those 30 minutes a little bit of a glimpse of the diversity of, of uh, programs and of, of really groundbreaking, impactful uh, research and the many thought-provoking topics that many of our alumni and our faculty are working on. So you can stay for the one session. We would love it for you to come back to the second and to the third session. In between, you have a break. You can stay in here and talk to people or go across to the quad, to the, uh, to, the, to the various activities across the street here. So, uh, this first grid act session will be moderated by one of our deans. All of them will be moderated by, by any of our three deans. So this first one will be Dr. Scott Casper, who is the Dean of the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences. Please help me welcome Scott to the stage. Here you go, Scott. Thanks, Carl. Oh, you, you have your own mic. Yes. Thanks, Carl, and welcome. Or if you are an alumnus or alumna, welcome back. We're thrilled that you're here for these very first Grit X, talk, Grit X Talks at UMBC. This first panel is very exciting. It features two alumni from theater, one professor who is an environmental engineer, and a professor who is a political scientist. A great representation of the variety of strength at UMBC. I would like to introduce our first pair of speakers. Kirsten Pagan, who graduated with her BA in theater in 2011, is a photographer, marketer, manager, and general champion for the arts in Baltimore. She earned her BA in design and production from theater in UMBC, at UMBC in 2011. She, alongside other UMBC alumni, formed the Interrobang Theater Company in 2014. It's a small theater company focused on offering professional opportunities for young theater artists and establishing Baltimore as a vital city in the contemporary theater scene. Kirsten also works full-time at Baltimore's Everyman Theater as the graphic designer and video producer. Kirsten often takes on graphic design, marketing, consultation, and photography projects when she's not working for every man in Interrobang. And in her limited spare time, it's hard to imagine having spare time with all of that, all those occupations and opportunities, Kirsten enjoys showering, eating chipotle, petting kittens, and organizing things. Her partner in presentation today is Katie Heilman, who is the artistic director and founding member of the Interrobang Theater Company and a very proud BFA acting grad from UMBC in 2012. At Interrobang, Katie has worked as a writer, director, and actor. Acting credits with Interrobang include Kermore, which is a co-production with the Strand Theater Company. I would note also that Kermore was written by one of our theater faculty, Susan McCulley, Heavy Hors d'oeuvres, and Scab. Most recently, Katie and the Interrobang Theater team had the privilege of touring Kermore with UMBC's Girl Parts Productions performing at Fringe New York City, a very competitive Fringe festival to get into. 
Outside of Interrobang, Katie has worked with many local theaters, including Rep Stage, Single Carrot Theater, Iron Crow Theater, Force Collision, EMP Collective, and Rainbow Theater Project. So it's a pleasure to welcome Kirsten Pagan and Katie Heilman, who will be talking about When Art Becomes Your Business. Kirsten and Katie. Thanks. Thank you. Hello, everyone. <laughs> How's everyone doing? Good. My name is Katie Heilman. I'm the artistic director of the Interrobang Theater Company. And I'm Kirsten Pagan, and I'm the managing director of the Interrobang Theater Company. And we're here today to tell you the story of how we started our very own theater company in Baltimore. And the story actually starts right here at UMBC. We all went to UMBC, and we first met when we worked on a little show called Las Meninas, uh, which the theater department did in the fall of 2010. Uh, I was the stage manager. Katie was an actor in the show, as well as our other co-founders, David Brasington, Jesse Poole, and Brady Wheelton. And this was an important show because we all met for the first time. We went through a huge tour with the show, and uh, it was cool, it was successful. <laughs> and I graduated in 2012 um, after the whole Last Minion Us thing happened, and I went on to work at Center Stage, a professional theater in downtown Baltimore. And Katie? I graduated, graduated with my BFA in acting in 2012, and I didn't do anything with my degree post-college. I thought theaters would be lining up to hire me because I had just done this amazing show professionally before I even graduated, but that turned out to not be the case. It turns out that acting is really hard. Uh, but what I did do is I did read a lot of scripts, and in the summer of 2013, I read a script called Scab by Sheila Callahan. I had sort of been going through all of her plays. I discovered her while I was a student at UMBC and totally fell in love with her, so I was just going through her canon. And I came across Scab, and it really stuck, struck me in particular because all I could do was picture myself and my friends in all of the roles. It's a really relatable, really compelling script, and so I thought to myself, we have to do this. So I reached out to my friends, who also were not doing anything post-graduation, and I said, let's do this. Let's put on a show. Why not? So, we all got together and started to plan a production, and as you can see, there's a lot to take into consideration. Um, almost too much for five actors who have never really been on the other side of the table to take on. So I decided I needed help, so I reached out to the best and brightest theater professional I knew, Miss Kirsten Pagan. So when Katie contacted me, I had been working at Center Stage doing marketing, and so that was sort of my expertise. Um, and as we talked more and more about producing the show, we quickly realized that we didn't want to just produce a show, that we really wanted to create a company where we could do more shows like this in the future and offer opportunities like the ones we were creating for ourselves for other students um, coming out of academia uh, to conquer. So the first two things we needed were a name and a mission. The name actually came really easily. Uh, a member of our company, Jesse Poole, had this word and this symbol in mind, an interrobang. And an interrobang is this symbol right here. It's a punctuation mark. It's a combination of an exclamation point and a question mark. And it basically rep represents what those two punctuation marks, those feelings that they invoke, bringing them together. And we really liked that because not only is it like a fun word to say and people are wondering what that's about, but it's really representative of the work that we're trying to do in Baltimore and I guess the feelings that we want our audiences to have when they leave our shows. So once we figured out a name, we needed to determine a mission. We needed to figure out what we wanted this company to do. And so we had a little bit of practice um, from the capstone class that we took as a part of our theater education here at UMBC. And so we came up with three major tenets that we wanted to focus on. Um, the first is producing new and contemporary plays. We want to provide challenging opportunities for young artists and theater makers emerging from academia. And we wanted to do all of this in Baltimore. A big question we get asked all the time is, why Baltimore? Uh, you know, why not DC where the theater scene is huge? It's, I think, one of the largest in the nation. But we love Baltimore. We see it as a place of potential and a place for growth. It's a place where artists are doing their art because they feel passionate about it. It's not because they're trying to get a lot of money or get a lot of people to come see it. They're doing the work because they want to, and we really respond to that. It's also a place that's really receptive to new and interesting work. And so when we arrived and said, hey, we're a new theater company. Everyone welcomed us with open arms, and we're really proud to be a part of that Baltimore theater community. It's also just, you know, a little cheaper to produce in Baltimore, which is really nice when you're just starting out. 
So once we had our name and we had our mission, we got an email, we got a website domain, we filed for articles of incorporation, we opened a bank account, and then we started to fill out the forms for our 501c3 nonprofit status. And once we got to this point, everything felt very real and serious, but cool and exciting because we start talking about terms like president and vice president and secretary and treasurer and bylaws and that was kind of scary, but also super cool. So we, once we laid this foundation of a company, of a business for theater, we turned our attention back to SCAB, um, to the art, and we started to assemble a team of people to help make this happen. Um, I had met a woman named Lola Pearson while I was an intern at Center Stage, who is a director in Baltimore. She read the script, was totally on board with working with us on it, and she actually runs her own theater company in Baltimore, and they happen to have their own venue. So we were able to work out a deal with Lola to produce Scab at her venue, which is a church in Station North in Baltimore City. But we still had no money to speak of because we were brand new. We all made pretty sizable loans up front. We all accepted that that was something that would have to happen to get things started. But obviously, we wanted to make that money back. And it's also nice to make a little extra, too, if you can. So we decided to have a cultivation event. Uh, our company member, David Brasington's aunt, was generous enough to open up her home to us. And we built a theater in it, in her living room, with lights and everything. And we did a couple of scenes from Scab. We served some hors d'oeuvres, we talked to some potential donors, and people were really, they were really receptive and really generous, and we were able to purchase a light board off of that event, which was a big deal for us, and we were also able to fund the show. So then we do scab, and we have our tech rehearsals, we open the show, and people come to see it. We get a really nice write-up in the Baltimore Sun, just sort of introducing us as a new company in the theater scene, and people see the show, like we have good audiences and people seem to like what we're doing. And most importantly, we make enough money to pay our loans back to ourselves, plus a little bit more to pay ourselves small stipends for the work that we did. And we had enough money to continue producing, so we did. So since Scab, we've done six shows. Uh, most recently and most notably was Kermore by UMBC professor Susan McCauley. That was a huge collaboration between ourselves, UMBC, and the Strand Theater. And during its run in November 2015, it was a part of the DC Women's Voices Theater Festival, which is a huge initiative for women playwrights in the DC Baltimore area. It was a part of Charm City Fringe that year, and we actually just got back from doing it in New York as a part of NYC Fringe in August, and that was very exciting for us. <laughs> yeah, it was. So here we are now, about three years later, six shows in, roughly 580 likes on Facebook, 550 followers on Twitter. So what's next? Well, we don't really know, to be perfectly honest. But what we do know is that theater at its heart is a collaborative art form with lots of different artists of lots of different mediums coming together to produce a thrilling live experience. And we found that founding and managing in Terrabang takes that same energy. The art can't exist without the business. One side can't exist without the other. It's almost like the Interrobang itself, it represents two things coming together to make something new, exciting, and different. So while we're obviously still learning, we're really lucky to have had UMBC be with us every step of the way, and we're really, really proud to have gone to an institution that continues to care for and foster their artists even after they graduate. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten and Katie. Our next speaker is Dr. Lee Blaney. Dr. Blaney joined UMBC in 2011 as an assistant professor in the Department of Chemical, Biochemical, and Environmental Engineering. Since that time, he has established an exciting research program that it's fo that's focused on environmental issues important to Maryland and the Chesapeake Bay watershed. We are all very confident that Lee landed at the right place because his work is quite definitely gritty. Many of his projects involve treatment of wastewater and animal manure, and for that reason, he likes to tell people that he has the best smelling lab on campus. Today, Lee is going to tell us about the work he is doing, that his group is doing to understand the occurrence and fate of contaminants of emerging concern to the environment. His talk is entitled, Our Environment is on Drugs. Please help me welcome Dr. Lee Blaney. Our environment is on drugs. 
Our environment is on drugs. Literally. Think about it. Everything that we use has to go somewhere, right? Trash goes to a landfill or an incinerator. Bottles and cans get recycled. But what about all the other things that we use every day? What about the caffeine in our coffee? What about the sunscreens and fragrances in our personal care products? What about the antibiotics and the medicine that we take? Where do these things go after we use them? Well, the answer is simple. They go into the sewer system, and they ultimately make their way to a wastewater treatment plant. Now, our wastewater treatment plants have really been designed to handle more traditional contaminants, things like solid particles and organic carbon, nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus. So some of these specialty chemicals, like those sunscreens or antibiotics, don't always get fully removed during our wastewater treatment process. And therefore, they get discharged into the environment. So, like I said, our environment is on drugs. Okay? For the last five years or so, our group has been trying to measure the concentrations of those drugs in the environment. Okay? And this is actually quite a challenging task, because these chemicals tend to be present at pretty low concentrations. Okay? We're often dealing with concentrations that are less than 100 nanograms per liter. Okay? This is roughly equivalent to 100 parts per trillion. Okay, so 100 parts per trillion might be a little bit difficult to kind of visualize. Okay, so I want you to think about the number of people that have ever existed. Not just the number of people that are on the planet right now, but the number of people that have ever existed. Okay, that number is estimated at around 100 billion people. Okay, so to measure 100 nanograms per liter, we need to be able to essentially identify one person throughout all of history. Okay, a pretty challenging task. <clears throat> But with some of our partners, both in Maryland, throughout the rest of the country, and even around the world, we've collected environmental samples to measure the concentrations of some of these drugs in the environment. And we've really focused on three classes of contaminants, antibiotics, hormones, and sunscreens. OK, and let me tell you why. First, the World Health Organization has warned that this century, the 21st century, may be the start of a post-antibiotic era. Okay, it actually takes longer right now to develop and test and get a new drug out onto the market than it does for resistance to that antibiotic to first appear. Okay, now, there's a lot of reasons why antibiotic resistance occurs, but we think that low levels of antibiotics in the environment play a critical role. Okay, some of those hormones and sunscreens that I mentioned these are what's known as endocrine-disrupting chemicals. Okay, and endocrine-disrupting chemicals can cause developmental malformations. Um, they can also cause uh, interference with reproductive systems. And so the presence of these in the environment, especially at low concentrations, is concerning. Because if we start messing with the reproductive systems of different species, that might have cataclysmic effects up and down the food chain. Okay? So for all of these reasons, we're interested in antibiotics, hormones, and sunscreens in the Chesapeake Bay, in our backyard. Okay, now, for the last five years or so, we've been measuring antibiotic concentrations around Baltimore area streams. Okay, and what we've actually found is in most of the samples that we pull, we identify at least one antibiotic. Okay, so these are really everywhere. But recently, we started saying, okay, well, what about in the Chesapeake Bay itself? This is a large body of water. It's very dilute. Do we find antibiotics in the Chesapeake Bay? And what we found actually surprised us, because we found pretty high concentrations of these antibiotics. Okay, so for example, norfloxacin. This is a fluoroquinolone antibiotic that's used to treat urinary tract infections. We detected it at concentrations around 100 nanograms per liter. Okay, that's that concentration we were talking about earlier. And for us, this is actually quite a high concentration. And this is in the Chesapeake Bay. Okay? But we also found other antibiotics. And we also found other antibiotics from different classes. And this is concerning to us, because if we have all of these different antibiotics that we use for different infections getting into the environment, will that cause the development of multidrug resistant bacteria? This is a very big public health question. This is something that we're interested in. Now, our antibiotics are pretty hydrophilic. That means they like to exist in the water phase. But the hormones and sunscreens are more hydrophobic. And one of our concerns with hydrophobic chemicals is that they can accumulate in the tissue of organisms. 
So when we were doing that sampling in Baltimore area streams, we also collected some crayfish. Okay, and so we took these crayfish and we analyzed them for the presence of the hormones and the sunscreens that we were interested in. And sure enough, we detected these contaminants of emerging concern. Okay, in particular, we measured a synthetic hormone, 17 alpha ethanol estradiol. This is the active ingredient in the birth control pill in crayfish tissue. Okay, we also detected the sunscreen oxybenzone. So all these chemicals that we use every day, like I said earlier, they have to go somewhere. They're going into our aquatic environment, and some of them are accumulating in aquatic organisms. Right now, we're looking into the toxicity and the impacts of this accumulation a little bit more in the crayfish model. Okay, but when we were doing the Chesapeake Bay sampling, we also collected some oysters. Okay, this is you know, definitely an important part of the Chesapeake Bay economy. So we collected these oysters, and we also analyzed those for our contaminants of emerging concern. We found a naturally occurring hormone, estrone, although it can also come from wastewater treatment plants and agricultural operations. And we also detected two sunscreens, so oxybenzone again and homosalate. So if you have any personal care products that have an SPF number on them, a sun protection factor, take a look at the backside of the bottle, look at the active ingredients. I would bet oxybenzone or homosalate is one of them. Okay, so these molecules are in a lot of the products that we use every day. And again, because we're using them, they have to go somewhere. Okay, now, our data in the Chesapeake Bay is still a little bit preliminary at this point. But what we're hoping to do in the next year or so is to actually expand this analysis out so we can think about throughout different parts of the bay, you know, where are these concentrations higher, where are they lower, and how can we start thinking about remediating this problem? Okay? So how can we remediate this problem? Well, we really think that a comprehensive approach is needed. We need to design green drugs that can you know, uh, be easily degraded in the environment or in our wastewater treatment plants. We need to think about personalizing our medicine so that we're not using more medicine than we need and sending more out into the environment. We need to think about better drug disposal options. Okay, and we also need to think about better wastewater treatment. And this is one of the areas where my group has really paid a lot of attention. Okay, and what we try to do is we focus on processes that systematically degrade some of these contaminants. Okay, it's, it's actually quite challenging. Okay, and one of the things that we found when we were doing this is when we're trying to systematically degrade one contaminant, we're always forming something else. Okay, and so, for example, we do a lot of work with antibiotics. What we recently showed is that when we're degrading one antibiotic, we can actually form other antibiotics. And sometimes those other antibiotics are actually stronger, they're more potent than the one that we started with. So if we're not careful, we can actually make the situation worse. Okay, so this is where our group is really putting a lot of effort these days to really thinking about when we're treating these molecules, what are we creating? And how can we make sure that we're removing some of the toxicity threat associated with not just the parent molecule, but also all the other ones that are being generated in solution? Okay, so at the end of the day, we really think that antibiotics and some of these endocrine disruptors like hormones and sunscreens are really important, especially in a sensitive ecosystem like the Chesapeake Bay, because of the threat from antibiotic resistance and some of these endocrine disruption um, impacts that we see throughout different species. Our environment is on drugs. Let's give it the help that it needs. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Our third presenter, Dr. Tyson King Meadows, is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science, an affiliate associate professor in the Department of Africana Studies, an affiliate faculty member in the UMBC School of Public Policy, and most recently, an associate dean in the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences. He conducts research in the area of African American leadership, voting rights, political attitudes and behavior, and American institutions. His work includes Devolution and Black State Legislators, and When the Letter Betrays the Spirit, Voting Rights Enforcement and African American Participation from Lyndon Johnson to Barack Obama. Dr. King Meadows' research has benefited from a number of prestigious fellowships and research grants, including a 2012-2013 American Political Science Association Congressional Fellowship, where he worked as a full-time staffer for the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on the Judiciary. 
Dr. King Meadows is also a former president of the National Conference of Black Political Scientists. He has spent more than two decades working with local, national, and international organizations on projects related to civic engagement and good governance. Dr. King Meadows' talk today is entitled, Why the Color of Your Canary Matters for Democracy. Dr. Tyson King Meadows. Good afternoon. These events for the 50th anniversary are great, aren't they? You're having a good time? There are two major themes that run through the weekend that uh, are relevant to what I want to talk to you about today. The first is community. How do we build community? How do we sustain community? And how do we recognize our common interests? The second is context. By celebrating what happened 50 years ago today, we learn more about our own democracy. By putting yesteryear and today in conversation, we learn about our common interests and our unique interests. My research addresses how people understand their common interests. Specifically, I'm interested in political coalitions and how they form, and what the formation of those coalitions mean for democracy. You know, some days some people say that right now we're interested in destroying coalitions instead of building them, but that's a, another subject. Democracy needs coalitions to survive. The key question in forming coalitions is, how do we get people to recognize their common interests? How do we get people to build community? In 2002, Democratic theorists Lonnie Guarnier and Gerald Torres wrote a book called The Miner's Canary, which is essentially about community. In that book, they say race is like the miner's canary. See, the miner took a canary down because the canary's fragile respiratory system would collapse long before a human's respiratory system. So the canary in distress would tell the miner that there was toxic fumes and it was too poisonous to continue. So what Lonnie Guarnier and Torres say is that racialized minorities are just like the miner's canary. Their distress tells non-minorities that there's something toxic about the environment. So in this regard, the miner's canary is a diagnostic tool and a prescriptive source. Well, while, while this is a very attractive uh, theory, I think it, it loses something about how race works. It also loses an understanding about how information acquisition and information processing actually works. And so if you think about it, this relationship of trust actually needs two things. One, the miner has to trust the canary's signal. The miner's canary has to be able to signal to the miner something's dangerous. And two, the miner has to trust the intentions of the canary. My contention is that race interprets, in particular ways, signals. In other words, the ways in which race work help to frame signals in particular ways. And the damage to that is that race does something difficult to this relationship of trust. And so when that happens, not only is the signal distorted, but the diagnosis and the prescription is undermined. And I base this based on two ways politics of race work. One, people hear and see race and think differently based upon what they think they hear. And two, race often acts as a proxy for and shaper of partisan identity. You know, black equals Democrat, white equals Republican. So imagine if the miner is listening for the signal. Imagine if the canary is otherwise thought of as suspect or foreign or inauthentic. So the miner listens for the signal and the miner says, hey, I'm anti-bird. I'm so pro-human, I'm anti-everything else. Or the miner says, I'm anti-canary. It's not that you're a bird, it's the type of bird that really matters. Or the miner's a colorist and says, I'm anti-yellow. Or the miner could say all three. I'm disinclined to believe any bird on this particular subject, but especially a yellow canary. So imagine the difficulty the canary has in convincing the miner to accept the diagnosis and the prescription. 
Well, let's think about how this works in real life. In a 1992 experiment, what they did is showed black and whites respondents this statement. Now, this statement is unambiguously about race and about government and about intentions. And so what they did is they varied who they attributed the statement to. In this case, the black canary is Jesse Jackson, Clarence Thomas. And what you see is that blacks, the black miners, are more likely to listen to the black canary. They also did this with a white canary. In this case, it would be Ted Kennedy and the 41st uh, President George Bush. What you see that white canaries and white miners, that dyad is much more persuasive. You say, hey, people hear race, they hear intention. They also did this in 2003. A group of scholars simply called individuals on the phone and asked them political knowledge questions, I mean, basic questions like I teach in Poly 100. How many Supreme Court judges are there, right? So individuals who thought that they heard a black canary, you didn't see any differences, okay? They heard the canary, they didn't see any differences. They heard race, but they answered the question. But when a white canary, when they perceive that the person on the phone was white. Black respondents had a different understanding of what the intention was. And so their scores went down. These authors use the theory of stereotype threat to say these blacks who were on the phone with the white canary felt pressured. They believed that they were being judged or evaluated, so they answered incorrectly. They did this because they didn't want to conform to white expectations about black intelligence. So they answered less correctly. And it's statistically significant. The authors say the problem is they heard race and heard intention. Now, there's a ton of research that has confirmed stereotype threat and implicit bias and its impact in decision making. So what my research assistants and I have done over the years is we've done a variety of experiments, both textual experiments where we don't show anybody and visual experiments that I'm going to talk about. The first experiment is when we were thinking about voting rights. So all we did is we put together an experiment where Republicans and Democrats were signaling as canaries that there was something toxic in the environment and we call that toxic thing registration fraud or voter fraud. And what you see here is that if a Democrat heard a Republican canary, they were less likely to say the DOJ needs to do something about it. So Democratic canaries were much more, much more persuasive than Republican canaries. We even controlled for attitudes towards voter ID laws. And here you see once again that Republican canaries are less likely to be persuasive. So you see a toxic environment, there's registration fraud, and Republicans are not listened to as much. We did another experiment, another text experiment, where we simply said, okay, you've got candidates who are talking about racial and income inequality. Who's gonna talk? So we had a text experiment where you tell them the candidate's black, or you don't tell the, can the candidates anything, or the candidate's a woman, or the candidate is white. And what you see here is that black canaries are punished. They are told not to talk about racial inequality and not to talk about income inequality. But white canaries are encouraged to squawk about inequality. White canaries are said, hey, talk, 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 talk. Black canaries, not so much. We did another experiment. This is where we design fictitious commercials featuring fictitious candidates talking about race, talking about gender, talking about income, different types of inequality. All we varied was the race and the party of the candidate. Now, the biographies were exactly the same, exactly the same. Here in this experiment, it's a Democratic candidate talking about racial inequality, and the visuals, the visuals are there to prop to prime individuals about race. We also measured racial resentment, and we also measured attitudes towards government inequality. 
So they're hearing and seeing race. Now, here are our findings, just for the racial inequality stimulus. Now, we're in Baltimore, so if you think of the dots sort of like swimmers, right? What you see is um, racial inequality if an individual candidate is black or white. What you see here on this slide is that when you're swimming further, that means that you're more likely to support. And these are Democratic candidates, and these are Democrats. So we took the Republican respondents out. And what you see here is that the white candidate is swimming faster than the black candidate. And black attitudes or anti-black attitudes also matter. And what you see here is that simply the black candidate is being punished for discussions of racial inequality. We also have results for other types of inequality. But we don't blame race. We don't blame race. What we blame is selective attention, what we actually focus on as a, as a group of human beings. Selective exposure, the kind of news sources that we think about, and segregation, the intentional, political, socioeconomic, and spatial separation of people who don't look like us, canaries who don't look like us. So in this case, even though the canary is sending a signal, the miner says, wait, did I select a yellow canary? Did I select this yellow canary? And in the end, it really doesn't matter because in the end, there are always signals about our peril. And if we don't pay attention to them, at the end, we're all going to be worst off. And so I leave you with this. What color is your canary? Thank you. Thanks. Wasn't that awesome? So I invite you all, first of all, thank you, or help me thank all the speakers of this first session. <laughs> And I invite you all, you have a good solid 25 minutes off. So the speakers actually say to their 10 minutes, except Scott, Scott and I took five minutes up front. So that's how it's going to be. Uh, we want to see you back here in 25 minutes for the next round, which starts at 3 o'clock. Thanks very much. I want to welcome you to that second session for GridX. Some of you have been in the first session already, and I see some new faces in the audience. Really glad to have you. Uh, and obviously, we gave a new meaning to GRIT, uh, Global Research Innovation Trends and Excellence, is the way we spell it in the research office. Uh, we've been planning for this. Uh, uh, we've been planning for this event for about nine months now, uh, and really had the goal of sharing with the community that's visiting this weekend much of the research, the scholarship, and the creative achievement that's going on on our campus, and, and really some of the amazing alumni and faculty successes. Uh, that we can share with you today. Uh, we have, as you may know from the program, uh, three 30-minute sessions, 10-minute uh, uh, talks by three speakers in each of the sessions, and then there's a break, and we hope to see you back for our third session at 4 o'clock uh, after, after you had a chance to go over and maybe uh, uh, relax a little bit out on the uh, really amazing uh, uh, parking lot across the street. So. Um, our second session will be moderated by Dean uh, William LaCourse, who is the Dean of the College of Natural and Mathematical Sciences, and please help me welcome Bill to the stage. Thanks very much. Yeah. Yeah, right. Well, this is definitely empowering to be on this stage. Uh, Bill LaCourse, Dean of the College, as Kyle said here, uh, I'm excited to be here to do a GridX talk, uh, to moderate this for you. Uh, what we're talking about is a journey out of darkness, right? And we think of science and other venues. Everything we do begins with observation. That's what good science is all about. That's how we learn. That's how we do things. And uh, we observe the world around us. And then if we want to go beyond what our human limitations are, we'll take that to the next step with technology, right? We make microscopes to see what is small. We make telescopes to see what's out far. We have things that are digital to send communication all around the world. And so now that we have all of this information coming at us, right, all this ability to see with all the spectrum through all the things, we're going to get three viewpoints on observation. One, we're being observed all the time, right? There are cameras all the way. You go past speed cameras. They're on post. We're going to get some viewpoints from that. 
from Rebecca A. Edelman. She's an associate professor in media and communication. She's going to talk about the Beyond the Checkpoint, Rethinking Citizenship and Surveillance. And then we're going to look up into the sky and look down at the clouds and look down at the weather and see why things are happening the way they are with Vandalay Martins, a professor in physics in the Joint Center for Earth Systems Technology. He's reaching for the skies, sun, pollution, clouds, and climate. He might be able to tell us why storms are so strong nowadays. And then Lee Boot, director of the Re Imaging Research Center, a grand visualization challenge, putting Humpty, Humpty, Humpty back together again. We have so much information coming out. And I don't know about you, I started off life with picture books. An image translates a thousand words. How do you take all this data and put it into one place so it's understandable? And so what I want to do with the introductions at the beginning is to have these individuals come in one after another. It's their time. It's your time to listen to what they have to say. And so that's it for me. I'll see you at the end. Thank you. Good afternoon. So, in August 2003, I set off a walk-through metal detector at the New Orleans airport, and no one could figure out why. They x-rayed my sandals, searched my bag, sent me through again and again, always with the same result. They scanned me with a handheld metal detector, and I set that off too, a couple of times. They called for reinforcements, and a uniform crowd descended to escort me away from the public space of the checkpoint and through an unmarked door into a room furnished with a metal desk, metal chairs, a dangling overhead light. A sheriff appeared and asked if there was anything I wanted to tell them. There wasn't. A TSA officer asked why I was setting off the metal detectors. I had no idea. They questioned and wanted me simultaneously. The alert of the device undermining my every protestation that I wasn't hiding anything. They took turns alternating between the metal detector and direct physical inspections, and the device alarmed at every pass, but their manual pat-downs revealed nothing. They began asking me to remove articles of clothing and became more aggressive in their questioning. An hour into this routine, they were getting impatient and I was getting nervous. I had no idea what would happen, but I sensed that the officials didn't either, having repeated their protocol over and over again without making any progress. Finally, someone suggested maybe they should try another metal detector. This time, silence. My captors magically transformed, becoming warm, jovial, almost, almost maternal. Their machine confirmed, mutely but emphatically, that we were on the same side and our lopsidedly intimate interactions had made us part of the same system. They returned my clothes, my shoes, and carry-on. As they guided me toward the door, they informed me that they would have to prepare a report, but would be sure to note how patient and agreeable I'd been. One woman put her hand on my shoulder and thanked me. She smiled kindly and said, you've really done a service for your country today. Now, at the time, this sentiment struck me as absurd and even insulting. I couldn't see how my compliance benefited the country, and I didn't really think I had done much of anything. I imagined myself as the passive victim of an overzealous security state, and this depiction is partially accurate. Scholars like Rachel Hall and Lisa Parks have observed how various checkpoint technologies and practices render passengers transparent or see-through and demand compliance in exchange for mobility. But my vulnerability was only half the story. And focusing only on the power of the officials overshadows my essential participation in this interaction, which in turn illuminates the contingency and fragility of even the intense securitization that followed September 11th. I had no metal on my person, much less anything dangerous, but the machines malfunctioned repeatedly. This triggered a response that wasted the time and energy of six government employees and hence potentially kept them from investigating other actual threats. The search of my baggage and my body turned up nothing and neither did, my, did, neither did their questions because there was nothing to uncover. They encountered impasse after impasse my cooperation was the only thing that went right. The grateful TSA agent revealed unwittingly how heavily the national security state relies on its citizens to partner in the work of surveillance. Indeed, even when surveillance technologies work properly, they don't directly guarantee public safety. 
So apart from the jerkiness imparted to their motions by the security cameras themselves, this footage from the early morning of September 11, 2001, shows the soon-to-be hijackers of American Airlines Flight 77 moving easily through Washington Dulles International Airport as they prepared to fly that plane into the Pentagon. Among the first hijackers to arrive, Khalid al-Midar clears security with only a brief delay and walks away with his chin tilted upward, his mouth slightly open, maybe a smile, maybe a grimace, maybe nothing at all. At one point, though the poor image quality makes his expression inscrutable, he raises his head and seems to look directly at the camera, but betrays no apparent reaction to it. Faintly visible some minutes later is the flashing red alert light on the walk-through metal detector set off by Nawaf al-Hazmi. His movements as he raises his arms, pivots, and raises them again are strangely gra graceful, and he is impassive as the screener moves the wand through the air around his body. Moments later, he turns to collect his bag, casting only the briefest look back at the man who has cleared him to move into the terminal to board his flight. Although the unblinking cameras perform their task faultlessly by clearly capturing the hijackers on screen, by doing nothing more than that, they also failed in a fundamental way and marked the limit of what surveillance alone could accomplish. The footage these cameras generated, which was apparently unremarkable at the moment of its creation, became agonizingly meaningful in retrospect and illustrated that if images were to serve any purpose at all for the besieged United States, they could do so only through aggressive and deliberate action on the part of actual people and organizations that wield them. The impotence of, surveillance, of the surveillance recording demonstrated that the state's survival hinged on the abilities of its agents and allies not just to passively collect images, but to interpret, manage, and actively use them. Consequently, the state would have to count on its citizens to say something if they happened to see something. That ubiquitous mandate revealed the state's awareness of its visual incapacities and deficiencies, but also signaled its intention to redefine citizenship as active visual engagement, not just passive acquiescence. And so the TSA, the Department of Homeland Security, and their partner agencies have, par have tried to make surveillance commonplace, but also fun. For example, in 2015, Homeland Security launched a multimedia Protect Your Everyday campaign to, to reinvigorate its See Something, Say Something initiative. The radio spots, videos, and posters feature everyday folks who identify themselves as teachers, barbers, and firefighters, and encourage their fellow citizens as follows. Quote, it's when you experience a moment of uncertainty, something or someone's behavior that doesn't seem right. These are the moments to take a pause, because if something doesn't feel right, it's probably not. It isn't about paranoia or being afraid. It's about standing up and protecting our communities, one detail at a time. Because a lot of little details can become a pattern. We trust our instincts, they say, just like you should, because only you know what's not supposed to be in your everyday. The commercials conclude with an instruction to report those little out-of-place details to the authorities and situate this practice as a part of a daily routine as unremarkably necessary as getting a haircut or sending your child to school. Now, at the same time, these agencies are infusing a new comedic sensibility into their work. Of course, this development would have been unthinkable in the immediate aftermath of September 11th, and it also sits awkwardly alongside the absolute seriousness of what's at stake, which is enforced, of course, by the establishment of no-joking zones at airports where you can be prosecuted for even joking about bombing or terrorism. Here, though, the visual joke of the elephant on the train or the cartoonish reference to x-ray specs enact, enact a whimsical form of conscription of everyday citizens into watchfulness on behalf of the state. Even the notoriously humorless TSA has gotten in on the act, most notably through its active maintenance of an Instagram feed. Now, some of the visual content here is rather dully bureaucratic or straightforwardly patriotic. And of course, the feed is crowded with images that justify the agency's existence, as in its photos of the large quantities of concealed weapons it intercepts every day. But alongside this predictable content are images designed to entertain. These include photos of their working dogs looking alert and friendly, interspersed with gratuitously cute images of traveling pets going through security and amusing photos of the weird things people try to sneak onto planes. 
However, the unquestionable highlight of the feed is the content generated by its Ask TSA feature, whereby curious travelers can take a photo of a questionable item and get the official answer on whether it can be checked or carried on. Now, many of the queries seem designed to poke fun at the TSA, mock the arbitrariness and restrictiveness of its policies. But the TSA responds gamely, providing detailed instructions on how people can safely transport things like sticks of butter, cans of gefilte fish, gladiator helmets, headlights, taxidermied animals, mummified human remains, and whole pies. And it works. In 2015, Rolling Stone rated the TSA fourth out of the top 100 Instagram feeds behind Kim Kardashian, National Geographic, and Rihanna. It has nearly half a million followers. Of course, Ask TSA helps to normalize controversial security measures and diffuse public animosity toward the agency, of which there is quite a bit. But it also makes explicit the kind of citizen part participation on which security increasingly depends. Thank you. So you can see here how surveillance can have a lot of different meetings and how we interpret it. And now you're going to probably look at it differently when you go through the airport scanner next time. Next we have uh, Vandalay Martins who's going to talk us a lot about the, uh, the satellite imagery and the types of works that he does with the CubeSats. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm a professor in the physics department, and I'll tell you a little bit about uh, our work uh, with the sun, pollution, clouds, and climate, and the relationship between uh, these things. <clears throat> so when you have sunlight reaching the top of the atmosphere, Earth's atmosphere, so part of that sunlight gets reflected back to space. But part of that sunlight gets absorbed by Earth's atmosphere, or gets absorbed by the surface on Earth, and contributes to warm the planet. So that's the energy driving force that keeps our planet as we know it today. Now, part of that energy that gets reflected back to space does not contribute for warming up the planet. And the part that's absorbed by the atmosphere warms up the atmosphere of our planet. So I will focus on these two topics in red. So the light reflected back to space and the energy of the sun that gets absorbed by uh, our atmosphere. So that light is reflected by particles in the atmosphere and by clouds. Now, we all have heard about uh, greenhouse effect and climate change, global warming in general, and the effect of CO2. So by adding CO2 to the atmosphere, we are increasing the greenhouse effect and we are making our atmosphere warm. So I just want to use that as an example, because I want to give you another perspective, a little bit more information on that. So the CO2 effect, the greenhouse effect, is on the order of two watts per square meter. So that's what's warming up the planet due to human pollution. The other components of the atmosphere, clouds and particle pollution in the atmosphere, the main effect that they have the solar light is to reflect that solar light back to space. And that has, in general, an opposite effect. So that would have an effect of cooling the planet, of cooling Earth because of the energy that gets reflected back to space. Now, a gas like CO2, when you disperse that to the atmosphere, it gets homogeneous distributed very quickly and goes around the globe. And everywhere you have more or less the same concentration, more or less the same effect. Clouds, as you know, when you look at the sky, they're very variable and you see very different clouds in different locations, different times of the day, and they change all the time. And so are the aerosols, or the pollution that we have in the atmosphere that we produce. So when those particles are emitted to the atmosphere, they don't get homogeneous very quickly in the atmosphere. So they travel, they can travel very long distances, as you can see with the dust coming from Africa and going all the way across the Atlantic and reaching the Americas. Or as you can see with biomass burning in the Amazon that uh, can travel and go to the ocean and mix with sea salt. So those particles can also travel long distances, but they're very, very variable. And you can see here several examples of that. So sea salt in regions of high wind speed, biomass burning in Africa and uh, in the Amazon in South America, 
uh, sulfate pollution particles in the northern hemisphere. And of course, those particles are emitted everywhere, but they um, have high concentrations in some regions and they travel all around the globe. So they have very, very variable effect. Now, <clears throat> those particles directly affect clouds on Earth. So there would be no clouds on Earth if it wasn't for particles in suspension in the atmosphere. So every single cloud, every single droplet in the clouds on Earth atmosphere is formed around a pollution particle. I shouldn't say pollution, because natural particles also. So you have particles emitted, for instance, by forests, biogenic particles that are in the atmosphere. Water vapor will condense around those particles and will grow as cloud droplets and will form the, the clouds uh, that we know. Now, because those particles are essential for cloud formation on Earth, they also control the cloud properties. So here, if I have a case where um, the atmosphere is clean and you have particles, but very low concentration of particles, the cloud droplets will form and they will grow much larger. So you're gonna have large cloud droplets and that's the first thing that's needed for precipitation, that the particles can grow large enough and rain and fall. Now, as you add pollution to the atmosphere, as you add more particles to the atmosphere, you have now more particles to share that water vapor, to share the water, and as a result, you have clouds with smaller droplets, having much more numerous cloud droplets, but much smaller sizes. Smaller sizes reflect more light, so you have now more light being reflected back to space and contributing to that cooling effect that I was talking about before. So as a result, you have brighter clouds due to the excess of pollution, excess of particles that you have in the atmosphere. Now, for the same reason, because now you have these smaller droplets in the clouds, it takes longer to rain, or it's more, the cloud is less efficient in terms of producing precipitation. So the cloud will live longer, again contributing for uh, reflecting more radiation back to space, but you will also affect the water cycle and will take longer uh, for a cloud to precipitate. So we're basically changing that whole balance. And then finally, also by adding those particles, the cloud, cloud because of the smaller droplets, have now the opportunity to grow deeper, and you have much deeper convection, much taller clouds. You know, we have measured clouds in the Amazon that are up to 10 miles in depth. And uh, then you have ice particles on the top of the clouds, and the storms can go stronger, and there are many effects that come from that that we don't understand very well. So I'm giving you here some of examples of this effect on how we are, as humans, changing our environment and producing huge effects around us, but we don't really completely understand these effects. So because of that, as part of our work here at UMBC, we have proposed and we have now been developing a small satellite that addresses this type of questions. And this is the HARP satellite, which is designed to measure clouds and to measure aerosol pollution, measure both together and help us to answer this type of questions. So HARP is actually a small satellite, so it's the size of a loaf of bread. So it's a very tiny satellite. And if you have a chance, today, this afternoon, after the talks, Swing by the physics building, in the first floor, we have the satellite there exposed, so you can see a real model of the satellite with the right size, with all the properties um, in the building, and we have other demonstrations there for you to see. So you can see here, on the hands of uh, one of our engineers here at UMBC, so the instrument that does all the measurements. So it's a very tiny camera that has a lot of um, important properties and can measure things, like you see all the yellow uh, drawings below the satellite, so seeing the clouds and the atmosphere from many different perspectives to make those measurements. So this is a real piece of hardware that was designed and built here at UMBC as a model for future bigger satellites. So we would like to go from the loaf of bread size of satellite that we are developing today to do these measurements to a school bus size of satellite where we can do all the measurements that we need. Not really because I just want a bigger satellite, but because we can add more measurements and we can have more things done simultaneously. So then what are we doing here? So as I was saying before, so the science behind um, our HARP satellite 
is to look at pollution, anthropogenic particles produced by man and emitted to the atmosphere that are affecting our environment, that are affecting clouds, that are affecting precipitation, and you study how all those processes happen. So those are things that we are doing here uh, at UMBC in collaboration with other institutions, including NASA Goddard. And uh, just as an example, so when you look at a cloud, or when you take a picture of a cloud with your camera, you see the image that you have on the top there. So you see the white clouds with their variability, with their distribution. But when HARP, when our satellite look at clouds, HARP doesn't see that. HARP sees the image that you have below. So HARP sees all these colors. HARP sees all these rainbows because of the way the instrument is developed. So that's designed so that we can tell what are in the clouds. And we can measure things like this that tells us the size of the droplets inside the cloud, that tells us the pollution around the clouds. And we can measure simultaneously the cloud and the pollution around it. So this is a small satellite that we have been developing here at UMBC, but with a very great ambition. And it's a small satellite that will make lots of measurements. And we have our students involved, our faculty involved. And we really have a great ambition for these measurements and for the future. Thank you. Now, I wonder if you're ever going to look at clouds again the same, right? They still have the same beauty, but you know, they're going to be, they challenge us. So now it's my uh, pleasure to introduce Lee Boat to the stage. Uh, he's going to talk about visualizing knowledge in many different forms. So it's, we're going to have delve into the mind of the artist, and he's going to see the magic of imagery. So. Thank you. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Good. Uh, the Imaging Research Center is artists, software engineers, and people from all disciplines working together to determine how we can use information technologies to increase the impact of valuable knowledge. Technology can be a beautiful thing. Let's do a brief review. Fire, oh, solved the cold problem, and beautiful to look at as well. Roofs, I'm bald, roofs. Brilliant. Can, can we have a round of applause for Roofs, please? Show some love for Roofs. But our new information technologies, our phones, for example, while they give us amazing access to astounding amounts of information, that capacity fails to translate into real progress on our biggest challenges. Essentially, they're not doing for us what these great technologies did for our ancestors. Even though we know how to prevent most of the chronic diseases that cause premature death, we know how to solve climate change, we know how to reduce poverty with education. And the experts are delivering this information from on high, but it's not helping. Why? Let's think about the way we represent and structure information for just a minute. The book is the gold standard, very detailed, right? But did you ever notice that books only show two pages at once? What about all the rest of the information? And your phones show all this discrete, tiny pieces, all these tiny pieces of information, but they're completely unconnected. And you look at it through this tiny window, which disconnects you from everybody else. PowerPoint is the worst. When you see this slide, there's no trace of any other slide that is in the deck. You have to remember those connections yourself. The web is the same way. You look at what's on web, one web page, and you tab away to another web page, and the one you were looking at is gone. Poof, it disappears. When it comes to making the connections between information, you're on your own. So that leads detectives in movies and TV uh, to make these things that the writers call crazy walls. Oh, it looks like my, I don't know where my microphone is. Can you guys all hear me? I love these crazy wall things they have. This is the one from Homeland. But on a more serious note, Stanley McChrystal, the general from Afghanistan, 
was forced to make this PowerPoint slide to try to describe to his troops why they were, you know, the kinds of human and difficult and messy uh, complications that they were dealing with uh, in Afghanistan. And this slide, him trying to deal with the technology limitations, earns him a New York Times article called, We've Met the Enemy and It is PowerPoint. <laughs> Modern people aren't supposed to think this way. It's, it makes you crazy. There's, it's, it's culturally uh, counterintuitive. It's counterculture, countercultural to think in terms of connections and context. We like singular. We like the elevator pitch. We like the silver bullet solution, one thing at a time, the single bill, the single pill that cures all ailments. It's a kind of myopia. And the question is, are the things that we can't see blindsiding us? For example, that would explain why health treatments that look great in the lab or in a clinical trial don't translate into clinical practice. Or why we can come up with amazing vaccines and again tell the people to take them from on high and people refuse. We're failing to take into account the human factors like culture, identity, and human emotions like anger and mistrust. Things that are a little messy, a little complicated, and we tend to keep off the table. But our information technologies don't just divide up information. They divide up people, too. So we spend our lives in echo chambers, hoping that our side will win, even though we know that political problems require relationship building to solve. So our information technologies and the way we represent and structure knowledge breaks everything up. And in my opinion, our civilization is having a Humpty Dumpty moment. So the Imaging Research Center is looking at this as a grand challenge. And two recent computer science graduates, Boris Boyko and Jeremy Neal, uh, have tried to address it um, with a framework, a new software framework. That's actually pretty simple. This is a 3D virtual space, and the ground plane is a Google map. And ideas are things, very sophisticated terminology, things. Things can be, the, the, the thing there is a factor, a piece of knowledge. Things can be any color, any shape. Uh, they can be shiny. You can name them anything you want, and you can put a bunch of them in the same space. And you can draw the connections between them in explicit ways. You can make them children, and parents to one another, so you can uh, mimic the way an outline works, and you can connect them to the map using latitudinal and longitudinal data. So to try out this software, and for other reasons that we care deeply about, uh, we have a project called the Art of Transformation. Um, and that's UMBC staff, faculty, and students working with community organizations and community residents in Baltimore to try to develop culture-based solutions to, and, and approaches to uh, community development. Culture-based solutions are not the norm, so it's an exciting project. What you're seeing here is a feature of the software. It allows you to do tours through visualization models, and this is the one we've created for the project. Um, so you see Baltimore City and a bubble above it that says challenges and opportunities. The challenges and opportunities of Baltimore City can't be dealt with one at a time. You can't just deal with education and not deal with transportation, public health, uh, or crime. These things are all connected. Everybody knows they're, they're connected, but this is the only place that you can see them as connected. As you go up to 40,000 feet, that's a, meta, that, that's a metaphor we use in this software, you see ideas that are more abstract and more conceptual, um, but nonetheless impact those more close to the ground factors uh, down below. So we interviewed people in the community over a period of time to try to understand what creates something that social psychologists call uh, a psychological sense of community, or what we're calling the soul of a community. And 
they, what they said helped us build this model, and of course we shared it back with the community. What they said was that the local economy, local businesses in particular, are incredibly important, locally owned businesses uh, that they patronize. And the arts create a sense of community, they create a glue, a, a social glue, and there's a kind of magic synergistic triangle between these factors, uh, local economy, arts, and the soul of a community. The way they described it was using these kinds of terms, love, support, sense of place, pride, etc. And what's great about what Boris and Jeremy have done here is in this software model, you can hear the words of the community members, the real stakeholders in this situation, describing what their ideas were. You just click on one of the things, uh, up comes a, a media card, you click and you could play, you'd be able to hear Denise Johnson if the sound was on, but I'm just trying to demonstrate the software here. And really get a sense that this entire enterprise where university people and community people are working hand in hand um, is a collaborative effort without a real hierarchy. Um, and this is a public piece of software. So instead of the experts sort of telling people again from on high what the, what the valuable information is, anybody can go into this software and they can participate and they can build models and they can add their own media. So this is just a framework. This is a very early experiment. We wanted to find out what happens when you put ideas into a virtual 3D space where you have more room. And you don't have to be reductive. And we can be comprehensive and inclusive. Thank you very much. Wasn't this awesome? Another round of applause for our three speakers in this second session. And we hope to see you back in about 25 minutes for round three, the third one of our three sessions that we have today, where we have uh, such topics as from research to research, inventing tomorrow, and teaching politics in an area of civics decline. So. Have a few minutes, our speakers are going to come out, you can talk to them in person while they're hanging with you, and then we hope to have uh, all of you, most of you, back here in about 25 minutes. Thanks very much. Good afternoon. Some of you have been here already, so you know the drill, but uh, I'm really glad to see. How many of you have been here to some of the earlier sessions? I love that. <laughs> And several of you here for the first time, uh, you may not uh, have been in this building before. This is the very beautiful Earl and uh, Danielle Linehan Concert Hall. And uh, as I said in the earlier two sessions, if Freeman would be standing here, we, he would ask all of you to give a hand to Earl and Danielle. Can we just do that? <laughs> Grit X, Global Research, Innovation, Trends, and Excellence. That is how we spell grit in this session when we talk about the impact and, and the really incredible achievements of, of our faculty and of our alumni uh, over the last, uh, well, five decades now. We're highlighting probably more the last two decades, to be quite frank. And we already had two great sessions of about 30 minutes each, three, three uh, talks in each of the, the sessions. And you will now uh, be participating in the last of our three sessions today for GridX. So in order for us to uh, keep the program on schedule and to really get to the faculty and the alumni that speak, it's really my honor to introduce uh, the moderator for this third session, that's Julie Ross, Dr. Julie Ross, who is the Dean of the College of Engineering and Information Technology. Help me welcome Julie. <laughs> Good afternoon. So thank you all for coming here today for our third session of Grit X. And I have to tell you, I'm so impressed to see so many people here when there's all these competing events on campus. Um, so many exciting things happening around the 50th anniversary. So we're just thrilled to have you here on campus and really thrilled that you chose to spend some time with us uh, listening to our fantastic faculty and alumni here this afternoon. So let me get right to it and introduce our first speaker to you. We've got a great lineup today that I think really shows you both the breadth and the depth of the impact UMBC is having. Our first speaker is Dr. Kosonia Wise-Whitehead. Um, she's an associate professor of communication and African 
in African American Studies at Loyola University of Maryland. She's an award-winning curriculum writer and lesson plan developer, an award-winning former Baltimore City middle school teacher, and a three-time New York Emmy-nominated documentary filmmaker. So she's done all kinds of interesting things. She received her degree from UMBC in language literacy and culture in 2009. She's the author of a number of books, articles, opinion editorials, um, and is an in-demand motivational speaker and prolific blogger, a guest commentator on WIPR, and a frequent guest host of the Mark Steiner Show on WEAA. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kasonia Wise Whitehead to the stage. Thank you. So I consider myself to be a me-searcher, and I have been training for this all my life. I got my first journal at the age of nine, and with the seriousness of a nine-year-old, I begin to document all the important things in my life. Uh, mostly boys, but talking about my hair and complaining a lot about my parents. And I continued writing about myself, kind of like navel-gazing, because I felt that I was probably the most important person in the world. I look back at my journals when I was 11 years old, and somehow or another, I was absolutely convinced that the world revolved around me. And I would say things like, people are too stupid to figure it out, and when they realize how important I am, the world is going to change. Well, I kept doing this me search, and when I got into college, my advisor said, you know, what do you want to major in? I said, I want to major in me, can you do that? And he said, we don't give BAs in navel gazing, but you probably should go into history. He said, you should put down the diaries and pick up archival research, and so I became a historian. And I continued that through my BA and my MA, thinking about my PhD, and then 15 years ago, something incredible happened. I woke up about 3 a.m. in the morning, it was my third time getting up that evening, and I said, at this point, I think something's happening to me, something's changing, and I realized that somebody had chosen me to be their mother. And I said, wow, I'm going to be a mother. And I was upset about that, because I said, I don't want to have children. And so I did what I always do. I, I started writing at 3 a.m. in the morning. I wrote a letter to my son in my womb. And I said, you're not going to change me. You're not going to make me into a better person. I'm going to remain who I am. You want my attention? You need to yell to get it, because you're just a passenger in my body as I go about my life. And so every day, I started writing something to him. So the next day, it's like, okay, I, I found out that you don't like when I eat Cheetos, and I don't understand that because that's my favorite food. Already, you're bending my will to suit your life. And so I began writing, and writing, writing. Every chance I had, I would write my oldest son a letter. And then he was joined by his brother. And so I began writing them letters when they were in the crib, and I would tape it to the wall. So I said, when they roll over and they're crying, they can see my words, though they can't read them they'll know they're there. And I would stick them underneath the mattress, and I would tape them to their bottles so that when their nanny took them out, she'd have something to read to them. And as they got older, I began putting letters in their shoes and putting them in their coats, and they would put on their robes, and there'd be a letter in the pocket. And they'd head off to school, and there'd be more letters there. Every letter started with, dear boys, I just want to tell you how important you are. And dear boys, you're superheroes, but you have your capes underneath your clothes. And dear boys, I have the best job in the world. I get to mother you. And even though I haven't learned how to mother myself, I'm working on doing that for you. And so one letter became 10, 10 letters became 15. And when my oldest son, who's now 15, when he turned 14, I realized I had 30 journals of letters to my sons. And I said, we should do something with this. We should publish this. I think the world wants to see what I'm doing. And it became my book, Letters to My Black Sons, and it became, for me, my research. So four things that I've learned. The first one is curiosity. And that first thing that was birthed for them in watching themselves grow up on paper actually started here on this campus. When I was working on my PhD, we met Dr. Freeman Rabowski, and he told my boys a story, and they were five and six years old. And he said how he would wake up every morning and look in the mirror and say, good morning, Dr. Rabowski, from the time he was 10 years old all the way up. People remember this story about Dr. Rabowski. So I thought that was an amazing story. 
The next morning, my boys woke up and I heard them in the room. Good morning, Dr. Whitehead. The White House is calling you. And good morning, Dr. Whitehead. Amtrak wants you. And I said, this is amazing. I went in the room and said, okay, I know why Amtrak is calling. I get that. But why is the White House calling? And my oldest son said, Mommy, the world's just falling apart and they need me. Well, then the White House is calling your name. You need to continue. So I began to document their curiosity. And whenever they would forget who they are, whenever they would fall off the path, I would slip them another letter. I'm like, this me search is taking over my life. I also had this period of discovery where they taught me things about myself. One of my favorite stories is from my youngest son when he was four years old. He was upstairs in his room playing, and I heard him at some point, he sneezed out loud, and he yelled out, God bless you, Amir. And so I brought him downstairs, and I said, Amir, you know, you're by yourself. When you sneeze, why did you say, God bless you, Amir? And he said, Mommy, sometimes when you're by yourself, you got to bless yourself. I'm like, you do. Sometimes when you're by yourself, you got to bless yourself. And so this discovery process for me is finding out about myself through them. So every time I struggled with my research, the work I do at my university, every time I struggle when I'm talking about 19th century black women, and every time I stumble with the writer's block, I pick up one of those letters I wrote to them to remind myself that even if nothing else sticks, I have something living in front of me, words that will continue beyond me that I'm pouring into my boys. There's also this moment of documentation because they picked up the writing process as well. I've taught them how to write and record everything about their lives. I often joke and say that in some households you have a college fund. In my household, we have a therapy fund because one day they're going to say, Mama, you wrote everything about us. We need to see someone and figure out what was so important about our lives that you could not stop writing. And why is it that you often say nothing stops bad behavior faster than a pencil? Because I know if you start acting up, I'm going to write it down. And a year from now, we're going to talk about it. That's how I give my lectures for bad behavior. But watching them birth their own activism. I saw that a lot during this whole protest movement with Freddie Gray. And they documented every day up on their wall what was happening. And when I marched with them for 10 days straight, coming home and all of us pulling out our journals and writing about what happened. And then we would share those notes like I do with my colleagues to see whose version of the story is the right version, and when did these things happen to us. So this discovery and documentation is also birthing the writing genius in them. And then finally, this notion of interpretation, trying to make sense of it all. Why is it that people don't understand that me search is just as significant, just as important? And I would argue, in some ways, more monumental, more life-changing than simple research. Because the words that I'm pouring into my sons that eventually got poured out into a book are able to touch people beyond me. It's amazing because people do and have read my book about this 19th century black woman, Emily Davis, and they've enjoyed it. But when people read letters to my black sons and they see my love for my sons poured out onto the page. It is a different experience. It's a different way of connecting. It's a way of taking the research off of the page and putting it into your lives. So the ongoing research for me is continuing with the letters. It's publishing the book Letters to My Black Sons, Raising Boys in the Post-Racial America. Going with my boys, we went through the 30 journals and picked out the best ones. We then did Race Brave. My sons asked me if I could write poetry every day about what was happening in Baltimore. That became my third book, Race Brave, New and Selected Works, all about the poetry that we created throughout the protest time. And then writing letters again and reminding them every step of the way that you might forget who you are, you might forget your voice. If you ever have that moment, and I know that you will, call me because we can get the journal from whatever year you're talking about, we can pick it up and we can find how you overcame every single obstacle and we can help you find your way back to yourself. Thank you so much. Wow. So I now understand that one of my most important jobs is getting the introductions done quickly so that you can you know, go on to these amazing speakers. 
Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Govan Rao. He's a professor of chemical, biochemical, and environmental engineering uh, here at UMBC and has been a faculty member since 1987. He was actually one of the founding faculty members of the department. And he founded the Center for Advanced Sensor Technology in 2006 and has been serving as its director ever since. Dr. Rao's research is targeted towards disruptive innovation. He's all about disruptive innovation. The sensors developed by uh, Dr. Rao and his colleagues in CAST have led to paradigm shift in bioprocess technology, so they enable high throughput bioprocessing. Recently, the Rao Lab has also developed a non-invasive sensor technology for neonatal monitoring. The current focus of their work is to develop next generation manufacturing technology that's aimed at producing protein-based therapeutics at the point of care. Think therapeutics on demand. A major effort at CAST, and something that I know is near and dear to Dr. Rao's heart, is the application of sensor technology to reduce healthcare costs and to close disparity gaps by making innovative low-cost devices for use in low-resource settings. And Dr. Rao and his colleagues have a number of patents, many of which have been licensed. He's won many, many national awards, too many for me to list today, and when you hear this next talk, you'll understand why. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's great to be here, and it's a real privilege to stand here and talk about what I've been doing at UMBC for about 29 years. I chose this rather presumptuous title so I could spell grit. <laughs> and I want to dedicate this talk to Michael Hooker, who was the president when I came to UMBC. And this is a historical picture. That's me. That's Michael Hooker. And this is Michael Hooker's other gift to UMBC, Freeman Hrabowski. <laughs> and so that pretty much rewrote our history. I'd like to start with this. This is a question I usually ask my students, and most people say it's a map of the world that aren't quite able to identify what it represents. This represents the number of people who live on less than a dollar a day. And if you think about that, at that point, it's just survival that you're thinking about. Forget healthcare. And it's easy to look at a map and lose the emotional connection. So I've taken some photographs that Rene Bayer took of the actual people and their stories. This is a Guatemalan washerwoman who makes a living by doing laundry. She herself is handicapped, but looks after her children. This is a little girl in Zimbabwe who gathers electronic waste to recycle the copper from printed circuit boards. And the reason you see tears trickling down her cheeks is because she suffers from malaria. So she's always in constant pain. These are two surviving children from a migrant camp in India. Their younger siblings died of malnutrition. So clearly, there's an enormous amount to be done to alleviate the suffering at this level. And the other alarming statistic that I learned later about five years ago is that there's a terrible problem of infant mortality in these low resource settings. This is a busy slide. Go back with one thing that you can remember. Every 10 seconds, a baby dies. That's bad enough, but what's more tragic is that it's preventable. And the leading cause is preterm births. When a premature baby is born, they're just too small. They're not able to keep themselves warm. And so they basically freeze to death. And this is, again, something that's a real tragedy that's easy enough to prevent by means of pretty much coming up with a replica of what mom provides. Mom is always ready to heat, cool, feed the baby. And this is what sparked an idea in terms of creating a low-cost incubator that, like mom, would work 24-7 off the grid and have both heating and cooling capacity. And I'm really fortunate in that I have access to a free workforce of extremely talented engineers. So I set these out as class projects, and students come up with different designs. We took it one step further, and I was able to get seed funding for these designs. And part of that involved coming up with these designs and a prototype. So the students built many prototypes, and one of which they settled on ultimately was made of cardboard. But we didn't want to do something top down. So part of the funds were used to take a field trip to India and look at the rural healthcare scenario there. And what was amazing, this whole incubator project has become a love story. People just drop what they're doing, they want to be involved, and want to help. 
These are extremely distinguished, busy people in India. One is the president of a university with 150,000 people. This other person is the equivalent of a Congressional Medal of Honor winner who serves free clinics for nine million people. So they took us on a trip, and this is what happens when a baby is born. The way they keep the baby warm is with a table lamp. And so we can certainly do better. So what we did was showed our cardboard design to a group of nurses and midwives and got their feedback to refine the design. And this was also groundbreaking because they said no one's ever asked us before. Most of the solutions come top down. So working from the bottom up, we came up and then we had to partner with a commercial manufacturer. Many things in academia fail because there's no mechanism to take it to uh, the ultimate customer. You need innovation. You need the business community to work with you. And we were very fortunate that India's largest neonatal equipment manufacturer readily agreed to partner with us. And part of the reason was because nobody's making any money on this. It's really a labor of love. We had a patent that UMBC returned to me and I let it expire. So now everything is in the public domain. The need for these incubators in India alone is about 300,000 a year. This entire company's manufacturing capacity is 2,000 a year. So given the gap, they were happy to help us to come up with a low-cost solution. This is something that I got last week. It is the prototype that's under test. And interestingly enough, it has the UMBC logo on it. And the first production run was of 50 units. How cool is that to celebrate our 50th anniversary? So this is going in a couple of weeks into clinical trials. And it's a very bittersweet moment. I think this will impact millions of people, but I'm nervous because we're asking mothers to trust us with their most precious possession, their infant, to make sure that these incubators are safe. So if you want to help, send a prayer. That would really be something that we could use. Okay, this is about the developing world and the low resource environment. In incidentally, what's interesting is it comes back full circle. Someone told me after Hurricane Sandy, we could have used these in New York when the power went out. So who knows? Someday what you do outside comes back to you. Let's switch gears to what's going on here. We are in deep trouble. You're probably seeing all the headlines about even Obamacare running into trouble because we're running out of money. And if you look at the projections, there's really very little discretionary money going to be left, and everything's going to be going into healthcare. And against this, now we've talked about people who live on a dollar a day or under. Now, these are United States government statistics. If you make more than 50 bucks a day, you're considered high income. That for a family of four is about 80,000 a year. And think about it. So that's about enough to make you sure that you'll get dinner tonight. You just have to choose Mexican, Italian, or whatever. Uh, but that's about it. God forbid you run into a situation where you need treatment for cancer. Turns out cancer is about to eclipse heart disease as the number one killer in America, and the treatments are incredibly expensive. So if you have insurance, you might get someone to cover it, and even then the deductibles are going up. But look at this number, about $10,000 a month is what you need. And part of the reason for these exploding costs is the cost of manufacturing these medications. And what we're doing, in our other project is to replace a traditional large pharmaceutical plant that would be about the size of this building, cost a billion dollars, and it essentially looks like a supersized brewery with fermentation tanks that are producing uh, medicines that cells produce. And we're trying to replace that with a briefcase sized device that will produce your medicines at the point of care. So if you're a diabetic, someday you'll be able to make your own insulin at your own home. And this is just proof that we've actually achieved this target. This is funded by DARPA. They're the people who've created the GPS and the internet. They give you these impossible challenges. And it is just an absolute joy to report that we're ahead of schedule and we've done the first demonstration of a platform. The brains behind the operation is Dr. Jeffrey Ling, who came up with this concept. And we were very privileged that the person who pushed the button was Lieutenant Colonel Robert Mabry. He's the medic who was the real live hero from Black Hawk Down. So the whole lab was taking selfies with him. And this is just a video that shows you, it's sped up of 20 minutes, compressed into 20 seconds. This is the protein as it's being manufactured and purified on a column. And when it comes out, someday you'll be able to inject that into a patient right by the bedside. 
So this is a remarkable project and it's a privilege to be part of this. But what really made all this possible is this diversity that I discovered at UMBC. That's me in about 1992 and that's the lab. Steve Altman was a plant physiology PhD. Jeff Sipior, Sipior was a chemistry PhD. Shabir Bambart was a chemical engineer PhD, all sharing the same office. That was one thing. But the other part of the equation, Steve was a devout Jew. Shabir was a devout Shiite Muslim. So he had a prayer rug rolled in under the lab bench. And Jeff was a spitting image. He had long flowing hair, looked like Jesus, the image you see, but he's atheist. So God has a sense of humor. And so it was just an incredible mix of people and ideas. And it's so very different from the America that we see in the papers today. So I hope things don't slide backwards. This is where we need to be. And the lab now is, has grown quite a bit, thanks to DARPA with the same diversity, people from multiple countries, Iran, Iraq, Philippines, China, India, Cameroon, you name it. So I'm hoping that we continue to make positive change for the rest of the world and harness the ingenuity of all these people and really make transformational change possible. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. Our next speaker is Dr. Thomas Schaller, who's a professor and chair of the political science department here at UMBC. He's now in his 19th year here and teaches courses in American government, including the American presidency, interest groups in lobbying and campaigns and elections. He's the author of a number of books and a former political columnist for the Baltimore Sun. He's published commentaries in some little known venues, the Washington, Ti the Washington Post, the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, the Boston Globe, just to name a few, and has appeared on some little known uh, shows, ABC News, The Colbert Report, uh, NPR, All Things Considered, and Talk of the Nation on PBS. Um, and Talk of the Nation, PBS, The Travis Smiley Show. Um, since 2004, Dr. Scheller has given lectures on American politics and elections in more than 20 countries on behalf of the U.S. State Department. I think you're in for a treat with this one. Thanks, Lisa. Good afternoon, everybody. I have the challenging task of following Kay and Govind, and that's, uh, that's, that's quite a task, given how impressive they are. I'm going to try to talk today about how you make a citizen, which is something we don't really often think about, but I have to, to a certain degree, as part of my job. So my talk today is about civic lessons, teaching politics in an era of civics decline. Now, I have three college degrees. I'm the first person on either side of my family to complete even a bachelor's degree, and I have a PhD in political science, and you heard all that other stuff about me. But that, frankly, makes me no more qualified than probably most of you in the room to build a bridge or fix a cavity, do your taxes, or become the most successful basketball coach, male or female, in Division I college basketball history. And yet, <clears throat> you wouldn't ask a non-expert to do any of those things, but we ask non-experts every day, certainly every four years, every two years, to have input into our government. We're about to have a presidential election Every four years, we say it's the most important election in our lifetimes. That's probably not true, though this is a pretty important one, I would argue. Uh, we'd be foolish to have non-experts do tasks that require expertise, and yet the curse or blessing, depending on how you want to look at it, of a democracy is that every single citizen, regardless of how familiar they are with politics and policy, whether they have been a citizen for just a month and recently moved to the country or recently gained their citizenship or recently turned 18, or whether they've been voting in presidential elections and have run for president, uh, all have a, a singular opportunity and obligation to participate in our government and select our leadership. So how do we get our student citizens, right? The vast majority of whom are, like really most of us to a certain degree, non-experts, but are qualified by birthright. Why do, how do we get them to take this responsibility seriously? Now let's back up and talk about what those students are like when they arrive in my Poly 100 class. Poly 100 is Introduction to American Government. It's required of all majors, but I have students from all different departments and different programs and majors because it's a social science requirement. So I have engineers and art history students and theater and dance and you name it, right? According to the Annenberg Public Policy Center in a 2014 poll, only about a third of Americans can tell you the three branches of government. About a third can name all three, and a third can name one or two. 
Only about one in four Americans know that it takes a two-thirds vote to override a presidential veto. Only one in five Americans, uh, uh, one in five Americans incorrectly think that a 5-4 Supreme Court decision can be overturned by Congress and reconsidered by the courts. So we're flunking high school civics. And in fact, a recent study in 2010, which they do a panel study of fourth graders and then eighth graders and twelfth graders every four years, shows that we're seeing some progress. We have a kind of a middling civics education and persistent socioeconomic and racial disparities in terms of that performance. Look carefully here at the scale. You can see the top 120 points and the bottom 110 or 120 points are cut off this graph. So it looks like it's a high score, but it's really in the middle range. And you can see significant difference in civics knowledge between white students, 8th, 12th, and 4th grade taken across time, and black students, as well as a race gap between white and Hispanic students. Not much of a difference on gender. Young girls are actually eclipsing young boys now. But you can see on the right, and this is also sort of an overlap or a proxy for the previous slide, since there are significant socioeconomic differences between white Americans and non-white Americans, you can see that those who are eligible for free lunch or a subsidized lunch have less civics information than essentially more affluent students. So our students arrive, and these are in some cases more affluent and better educated students. I don't even want to think about the students who don't get into UMBC and don't ever end up or take a poly 100 class. Even among these students, we have a big civics gap here. Meanwhile, of course, I don't think I have to explain this if you turn your TV on or your radio on for about two minutes right now, we have a very polarized country. And I could show you 20 different graphs that indicate that. And that's true on both the mass level among voters and it's true among elites. I could show you charts that show the polarization of voting in the Senate and voting in the House. We even have an almost record number of unified state legislatures because the red states are becoming redder and the blue states are becoming bluer. Here's just one measure, partisan polarization in the approval rating of presidents. You can see that Republicans with the red line approve of Republican presidents more and Democrats approve of them less. But the key thing to look at this as you look from left to right is look at how big the beige area is getting. The two most polarizing presidents in American history are Barack Obama and George W. Bush which means you either think they're the most polarizing in terms of their politics, even though Bush ran as a uniter, not a divider, and Obama ran as no black America, no white America, no red America, no blue America, only the United States of America. Either they're the most polarizing presidents in American history, which I don't think is true, or the country is basically more polarized than it's ever been, which I do think is true. In fact, when you look at who votes and who gives to campaigns, People, we don't even trust each other anymore. If you ask Democrats if they have a mostly unfavorable view of Republicans, they turn out at about 46%. But if they have a very unfavorable view, they turn out at 58%, 12 points more. Same for Republicans. Those with a very unfavorable view of the other side turn out at 18 percentage points higher. So we have a very polarized country, and we have a civics deficit for young people, and frankly for people over 18 and non-college freshmen as well. And of course, we have a very diverse country right now. 56.4%. That is the share of our freshman class that's non-white. So we have people coming from all different backgrounds, all different experiences, race, gender, obviously, uh, religious backgrounds, political identities. So how do you reach this group of civics challenge, is a polite way to put it, freshmen, some of whom aren't really in your class because they're planning on becoming a political science major, they really have aspirations of becoming an electrical engineer. How do we encourage this civics challenge group? My answer is sort of take the ideological and partisan politics out of it. They're going to figure, that out, figure all that stuff out for themselves anyway. I try to just do two things in Poly 100. <clears throat> and I was raised in a Catholic family with a German-American father and an Italian-American mother, so, uh, who was the undersecretary of guilt in the Carter administration. So I know a little something about using guilt to try to compel people to do things. And the first thing I tell these students is you're lucky to be in that chair. There's a fixed number of chairs either here or throughout the system. Not everybody gets a seat, Right? And this education, even if you're working hard, even if you paid full freight, many of them, of course, have scholarships based on need and other sorts of talents. Even if you paid full freight, you or your parents, you're still getting a subsidized degree, right? The USM budget, I think, is about 10% of the state budget, and UMBC's is 10% of that. So a penny, 1% of every dollar that Maryland taxpayers spend goes right here to UMBC. And your degree, yes, it's gotten more expensive than when I was an undergraduate, and tuition was $750 for a full 12 courses or higher full-time load in the SUNY system where I went to school. And the payout is there, too. The difference in lifetime earnings between a person with a bachelor's degree and a person with a high school degree is just shy of a million dollars. And if you think about the compound value of investing that, right, you don't just get it all at the end when you retire. You're earning that across time. That's the difference between being a homeowner and a home renter. That's the difference between being able to put something away for your retirement and not. So I tell students, despite the quality of the education you're getting in this class right now, you're getting a million-dollar degree. 
and you are. The second way, and I don't, I can't prove this because I haven't surveyed all the faculty. I think I'm the only faculty that actually shows his tax returns on a PDF on the screen, and I do. And with the exception of my social security number, I show them the numbers. I tell them they have to be invested in a system because the political economy, the decisions that your government makes, we talk mostly about national politics in Washington, but Annapolis or whatever your respective state legislature, they affect your life. They affect your life greatly. So I show them, for example, where I can take money pre-tax up to, I think, the current federal limit is sixteen or $17,000 and put it into my 403B savings and invest those taxes instead of paying taxes on it now and taking it as cash. I show them how the home mortgage deduction, I can deduct my taxes in the city of D.C. where I live, and I conduct the interest on my mortgage and how much that saves me, how much the government is subsidizing my condominium in Washington, D.C. And then we talk about those things. We talk about how the num one, number one and number two tax preferences, the things that the government spends the most on in tax deductions, are the employer credit to subsidize health care. It's about $260 million, billion a year. Okay? And the home mortgage introduction, which is about another $90 billion. A third of a trillion dollars every year the government spends for people who, by definition, own a home and have a job. And then we take a look at, well, how much is it spending on people who don't have a job or don't have a home or maybe have neither? So they're going to be politically invested in the system. The decisions that they make are going to affect their lives. And I try to get them from their wallets, from their pocketbooks, to think about maybe you owe something back to the state and maybe you better be paying attention to what the state does because it's going to affect you and your family and your livelihoods for the rest of your life. Thank you. One more thanks to, to Kay and to Govan and to Tom uh, uh, for their presentations, please. Okay. <laughs> That, that ends our GridX program for this year. Uh, the House of Grid awaits you across the hall. Uh, our speakers will come out either through that exit sign here, through that door, or on the top. You have a chance to catch up with them one-on-one. -on -one. But again, you know, we went from outer space to inner space. We went from me search to Homeland Security. We went from putting Humpty Dumpty back together again to so many other topics. Uh, I hope you had a chance to go to to more than just the one session that you're in, but uh, we, we hope also to be able to show you the really broad variety that makes up research and scholarship and creative achievement here at UMBC. Welcome back to campus for all our alumni, and, and thanks for all the, the community members of UMBC for being here. Enjoy the rest of the day, and come back tomorrow for another day of our 50th anniversary. Thanks very much.